whenever I put up a post about universal credit and I stick to just talking about my experiences with it you always get a range of comments and some of them are very knee-jerk reaction I think some of them are from people who only follow a very limited number of news and information sources um, they may be in their own echo chambers so they only watch news from news providers that give them what they want to hear and I've done a post before quite a while ago about what universal credit encompasses and I did quite a long post where I scrolled through the statistics pages so that you could see what was going on but I realized that's probably been lost somewhere in the mix I'll put a link to it um, and what I'll actually do is I'll put a link to the playlist that covers my universal credit experience so that you can see what I see now my experience is completely different from most other people's um, it's been quite simple for the most part up until recently and my reasons for applying for universal credit are different to some people so I have been migrated from working tax credits which means that you get a protected year so you're forcibly migrated from one system to the next and they give you basically they give you a year of grace they give you a year to settle into the system they give you a year to improve your income so that you reach the minimum income floor that they tell you you will have to hit after that year and if you go on to the regular universal credit system now I don't think that I will be eligible for universal credit after that year because some of the things that you get as a start-up year applicant don't apply when you're on proper universal credit such as I just need to prove that I am gainfully self-employed to remain within the system for that year which means I'm working at my business, I'm working at all my other side hustles, I report my income, they can see that I'm doing work um, you also get a bit of leeway on savings so the amount of savings you can have in that startup year is more they will take money off your monthly claim so that you get less money as a result of that but it doesn't necessarily stop you from being able to apply I don't know how that may or may not change in the future uh, my one year on universal credit ends next month um, I think this post Will probably go out in August which is the month that my claim will probably end so keep watching to find out what happens about that particularly if you are on the startup year and you're trying to understand what might happen when as you reach the end of that year but what I really want to talk to you about today is some of the figures that I've been looking at because there will be people who will post comments and say well they should just make all these lazy out of work people go back to work why why are they claiming universal credit why are they claiming benefits uh, lazy useless scroungers and you do get a lot of that and it's YouTube it's social media I'm not surprised because knee-jerk reactions it's easy to post a comment without having to worry about the repercussions from that it's just a comment so I've made a couple of short lists of things that I think are important to bear in mind when you are considering your response to all those lazy people and also people will often say well there's like a million unfilled jobs in the country why aren't they making all these lazy universal credit claimants take all those jobs so I'm going to start with universal credit statistics and you can't just say one thing that's the problem sort it it does not work like that so what I'm going to talk about here is we have we have the minimum wage which is the legal minimum that people can pay on a full-time 
uh, on an hourly rate. That does not apply, apply to the self-employed. It does not apply to gig workers. It does not apply in part to hourly workers or zero hours contract workers, um, of which there are still many. We're talking about people in regular employment, PAYE employment. Um, so you have what they call the living wage, which is the amount per hour that people should get to be able to have some quality of life. And then there is the minimum wage, which is less than that. So I think that the, the real living wage is um, regarded as being £12 an hour. And I think that the minimum wage is £11.42 per hour. So some of these stats are a bit behind because they tend to report stats at the end of a year, at the end of um, like a tax year. And because we are halfway through 2024, I have to look at figures predominantly pre-January 2024. So one of the statistics that I've got here is that in April 2023, 3.7 million jobs, uh, which is one in eight jobs, paid below the real living wage. Uh, and in December of the same year, so that's more recent, 38% of people on universal credit were in employment. So what we're saying is that 3.7 million people in work needed a benefit to supplement poor wages from their income because their employees didn't pay them enough or didn't give them enough hours. The next figure to consider is that universal credit households with children account for half of all households with a universal credit payment due and that was in November 2023. So that means that um, half of households claiming universal credit had children in their households. Now that can create all sorts of issues because if you have children at home, you can't work full time. It may be that your children are very young, they may be in school, they may have extra care needs. You, you can't work a full time job when you've got to pick up your kids from school at three o'clock in the afternoon. And not everyone can afford childcare, not everyone can afford after school clubs, breakfast clubs, etc, etc, etc. The number of people on universal credit in the no work requirements conditionality regime continues to increase, it says, and reached 2.3 million people in January 2024. Now, the no work requirements um, category means people with health conditions, so they can't work full time. They have caring responsibilities, that might be children, it might be partners, it might be parents, it might be other relatives, it might be that they have caring responsibilities for friends and other distant relatives. It also includes people in full-time education, so maybe you've gone back to school, you've gone back to retrain and you're doing it full-time. It includes people over the state pension age and it includes those households that have a child under one and it also includes people with no press prospect for work which can encompass all sorts of things. The number of people on universal credit in the working with requirements section, that means they are claiming universal credit, they are working, but they have to fulfill certain requirements like get more hours, um, get more pay, that sort of thing. That, um, that section of people has also increased from 0.8 million in January 2023 to 0.9 million in January 2024. So these are people who are working, they're not getting enough money in from their jobs, um, so they're signed on to Universal Credit, but they have to be filling in the tick boxes to keep getting the credit. Now the other thing that people complain about is, well, we've got all these jobs unfulfilled, why aren't people just taking the jobs? A lot of those jobs will be for skilled workers. So they will be in certain job, certain job categories where you have to have a certain number of skills or a certain number of educational qualifications. So a lot of people are unskilled workers. They have no skill at all or they don't have enough skill to apply for certain jobs. A lot of unskilled workers 
can't find jobs that pay enough to live on, um, which is why they end up in the working with requirements category on universal credit. They are working people, but they have no skills. They're very low down on the pecking order in terms of employment, and the jobs they can get uh, don't pay enough. Now, that may be that they are on the min minimum wage. The minimum wage is not enough to put a roof over your head these days. It may be that they are gig workers, self-employed. Um, they may have a job that, if they got full-time hours, might pay enough, but there aren't enough hours to go round. Um, the government's had several responses to this. One of them is simply to fill the gap by bringing in skilled migrant workers instead of retraining our own people to fill those gaps to, to get them the skills to have better jobs they're bringing in people just to fill the gaps um, but they're not getting enough of those qualified workers in the right categories um, a lot of the vacancies that are available are in hospitality so you've got the restaurant industry, you've got all those sorts of things, and they don't have skilled enough people to work in those. So very often they won't take people that don't have any experience of working in a restaurant or in fast food, and not all places will take people and train them. And you're, you're less likely to get migrant workers who've paid a lot of money for a visa coming in just to work in McDonald's they're more likely to be in social care, hospitals, that sort of thing. So a lot of the jobs are, that, are, that have vacancies are relatively unskilled in many considerations, but they just still can't get the people to fill them because they, have quite, they might have quite high expectations, they might not be willing to train people. Um, and the other problem, of course, is that many businesses don't offer flexible working for people who have health conditions who may want to go back to work but may have to work from home or part-time work from home or need extra help in the office with um, equipment etc to enable them to do the jobs properly. Many have caring responsibilities like they've got to go pick the kids up from school afterwards and many businesses don't want to have to allow for that. Um, so it's caring responsibilities which can be anybody who needs care. It might be a child, it might be a sick adult, it could be anybody. The other solution that the government has to people not taking these very low paid, unskilled jobs that don't pay enough to live on, the jobs that nobody wants, is simply to force people to take them. So that they will be in work, but they won't be able to live. So they do that by making it incredibly difficult to get the help, to get the benefits. So if you have an incredibly low paid, uh, a, a low paid unskilled job and it's not paying enough just to pay your basic bills, you won't get onto universal credit and get a top up, you'll be forced to take a second really badly paid unskilled job. Which is not how things should be working because one of the problems with that is if you force people into you know, really terrible jobs, it can have awful implications on their physical and mental health. And one of the other problems that we have in this country is that a huge number of people aren't well enough to work. And we definitely have a growing problem of a population that doesn't prioritise its health. I realise, of course, that there are people whose ill health is not as a result of anything they've done but we have a large number of people who are just not looking after themselves properly and getting sick because they don't prioritise their health. So th this is the other problem, this is again why we have so many problems with, like the NHS is struggling because it's catering for a larger and larger population of people who are ill, many of whom should not be ill. Um, and it just, it, it all jigsaws together and creates a massive problem. So you can't just turn around and say, well, everyone in universal credit is a lazy so-and-so. Because as well, don't forget, we have a mass migration from the old style system of working tax credits and the old style uh, disability allowances and things like that. Those people are being migrated onto universal credit. A lot of them 
like me will get the year a lot of people will not be eligible and will be forced into into work or into finding work even though they may not be able to get jobs because maybe they do have ill health but the DWP doesn't consider them to be ill enough to need help so it's not as si it's not as simple as saying well just force all the lazy people into work um, and make them take the one million jobs that are out there because most of the jobs they won't be skilled enough to do and the other jobs won't pay enough for them to pay their rent so I just wanted to make that comment because every time I put out a universal credit post I'll get the same people saying deal with the lazy people fill the jobs problem solved it is not that simple it really isn't and if you think that that's the problem if you think that's all it is you need to change where you're finding your information you need to stop watching the news programs that you watch that focus on very narrow reasons for things and don't explore the options one of the rules that I follow is never trust statistics if you see a statistic it's usually being pushed by a certain angle of a story go and find out what's going on on the other side of it when I was looking for the information um, for what I've just told you uh, I did look at the government website but then following on from that I went to four or five other sources to see what else was going on and to get a broader view of what was going on within those numbers because you can't just look at a number and go oh well that's solvable just do this or do that it's never that simple you can't just turn around and say well they're all lazy uh, get them into all those empty jobs it does not work like that and something else that I remember reading about I think last year was that a lot of jobs that are advertised don't actually exist what tends to happen is that because it takes so long for a company to fill a job it will constantly be advertising roles within its companies and so they'll, they'll have this constant run of uh, fake vacancies to keep people applying so that if a vacancy does come up they can quickly start interviewing and what it means is that lots of people will apply and those people will never hear whether or not they got through because the job didn't exist in the first place so when you're looking at statistics for available actual available jobs look at what the jobs are look at where they're coming from look at who's advertising them and look at if those jobs actually genuinely exist because a lot of jobs don't even exist and that's how the big companies deal with the problem of not having enough people to interview or not being able to do the process quick enough if they just keep advertising they keep getting a bunch of CVs they can keep them on file and and then you know eventually somewhere along, along the line that job may well come up in their company and they've got a bunch of people they can call in so you've got to look at all this information don't make knee-jerk comment reactions on things that you don't know anything about if you are not educated in a subject if you haven't dived in between the lines and you haven't looked at a figure and said well I wonder what that actually means go and research it you've got Google just go and research things everything you need is out there and stop being so narrow-minded